Welcome. Good morning. It's a great day. I don't know uh, if you're ready for this topic. How is your investment portfolio doing? No, no, you're you're at the right spot. This is a worship service. Uh, just be patient. There, it'll come around. But uh, you know, honestly, when it comes to investments, I have struggled. How do you stay ahead of inflation? How do you prepare for the future? What's the economy going to do up and down, all of that? We have listened to some wise advisors, and we have listened to some that we probably shouldn't have. Uh, When I first got my first job, my parents were those financial advisors. And they said, okay, first you open a bank account, then you put give 10% to church, and you can keep 10%, and the 80% goes to savings. And I thought, you are crazy. <laughs> but they were right, and after a little while, I was able to buy my first car. It was a cherry red 1967 Mustang. Yeah, yeah it wasn't new when I bought it. <laughs> I bought it as a repairable <laughs> It uh, it looked better in black and white than it did in color. I paid 50 bucks for it. I worked on it all summer. And then when October came, I was ready to paint it. Dad was overseeing this whole process. And uh, then the first snowfall, and I slid that almost beautiful the 67 Mustang into the front of a semi at a, at a stop sign, which is worse yet. And uh, then I sold that car for 50 bucks. <laughs> so there's a pile of parts. We treasure many things in life. We, we give our time, our attention, our money to so many different things. And some of them produce a good result. Some of them, fewer, have lasting results. And we are starting a short sermon series. It's titled, Your Heart, Your Treasure. And as we look at this, we'll be covering some topics. Worship, work, and giving. Today we're talking about giving, specifically investments. And we are the, the Bible tells us so many different details about money. Jesus told us a lot about money. But ironically, uh, money is a human invention. It's just a tool to tra- make transitions, a medium of exchange. But Jesus brought attention to that topic because it can so quickly become our God. Our use of it reflects what we value what we treasure, and it reveals what's in our heart. So people have many different attitudes about money. Even just the topic on a Sunday morning can rise all of these different images of greed or anger or fear. Uh, Hopefully, vision. That's another opportunity that money allows us. But some have been burned. Some have been robbed. And uh, maybe many, most of us in some way or another. But Matthew 6 has some encouragement and some investment advice for us. Jesus says in 20, verse 21, your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that is where the theme for this uh, mini-series comes from. So let's look at Matthew 6, 19 to 24. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then... The light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, 
For either he will hate the one and despise the other and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So in that text, there's four wise investment strategies that we need to take seriously. And the first two, the first one comes from the first two verses. It is uh, verse 19 and 20. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The point is, invest in things that last. Maybe it's an obvious point. But we invest in so many things that don't last. My My red Mustang is just one example. But our weekly garbage service is another example. Or our annual pick up the garbage on the street, the the large item thing, is another example. We have that happening in Crystal right now. Uh, So (laughs) there are people that are putting out their stuff. It's coming, picking up it on Tuesday, but it's out there already. And there's others that are driving around and they're collecting. I suppose that's a good thing in some way or another. We need physical things, even if those things wear out. We need clothes, food, shelter. Some would argue that we need a phone. Others would say that's not necessary. That's personal preference. I'm not getting into that. But most of our purchases are not investments. Even our investments that we make are temporary. So what lasts? There's three things that last. The Word of God people, and the things we do for him. Those are the only things that last, and so it makes sense to invest in those. My brother has a friend down in Florida who's been a very successful businessman, and so I had a chance to ask him some questions, and I thought, well, let me find out what he does for investments. And speaking from a purely secular point of view, he said, I invest in people. I thought, well, that's amazing. Somebody from a secular perspective can get a biblical principle. In fact, this whole idea of investing in things that last is why I ended up in the ministry in the first place. I had been uh, working as an engineer, a computer engineer, for seven years. I enjoyed it. It was going well. But the life cycle of technology in the computer world is very short. So you work hard on something for two years, and then it's out of date. And you throw it away, you start over again. So I took a week of vacation during that employment and went with our youth group to the Fly Convention, the youth convention in Colorado. And while we were there, some of the kids gave their life to Christ. And as I was going home, I'm thinking... One week, an eternal impact. Two years, disregarded, thrown away. And I couldn't any longer find contentment in things that would not last. And so that's where the Lord had directed and called me through that process. So how do we invest in things that last? That's a a kind of another important question, obvious question. Well, things at church are an important way, an obvious way. Uh, Investing in people. Lots of ways we can do that. It can be as a part of a teaching Sunday school. It can be uh, hosting a home group, reaching out to neighbors, caring for shut-ins. Lots of ways that we can invest in people. It's going to cost some time. But it's going to be well worth any investment that you might make. Second, where your tre- verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the point is, invest in seeking God. We invest, we seek a lot of things. We seek money, time, hobbies, adventure, all of those can be good. But the point is, when do we seek God? When do we make Him our treasure? Augustine, a scholar of old, theologian from the early church, 
said, to discover the character of people, we only have to observe what they love. To discover the character of people, we only have to observe what they love. And the social media industry has made a business model out of that very thing. They watch what you love, and then they give you more of that. If you like watching cat videos, all of a sudden you're going to be flooded with cat videos. Or political spectrum, they'll give you all of that. For, for me, it's uh, sports or adventure or things like that. And I, it's just a continual feed. Whatever you watch, that's what they'll feed you. Because their business model depends on how much of your attention they can grab. On average, people spend three and a half hours on their phone per day. That's 23 hours a week. 31% of our population says that they are online almost constantly. So then the obvious question is, how much time do you spend seeking God? That's a probing and a personal question. And that's what the call committee asked me when they were interviewing me for this uh, pastor position. How much time do you spend in daily devotions? And I said, uh, probably about an hour on good days. <laughs> I was glad that they asked that because it shows the priority of our church. And we have to make it a priority if it is going to have an impact on our lives. If we're going to be growing as Christians, we need to seek the Lord. And as a church, it is a priority for us. We have a high attendance in Bible studies. Lots of different Bible studies that are offered on even a Sunday morning or during the week, home groups. We have a lot of activity with regard to the types of things that people want to study. The depth in which they, we are wanting to study. Or even our prayer vigils, the fact that we can have a prayer vigil from Good Friday through Easter morning and it's filled up every hour. But what about you individually, personally? How are you seeking God? I've recently had conversations with three different ministry leaders who all three said that they had felt stagnant in their personal devotional life. And they were seeking how they can grow in that personal, in their seeking to have meaningful personal devotions. If we're going to grow, we need to seek God because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. John Piper said, "If you have you have already made a god out of whatever you take the most pleasure in." You have already made a God out of whatever you take the most pleasure in. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. Third, verse 22 and 23, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? We need to invest in seeing God. There's a difference there between seeking God, where we're looking for Him, versus seeing Him when we are looking around us and seeing His activity, His action all around us. This scripture cuts through time and culture and it speaks directly to us today Because many of our temptations, maybe most of our temptations, come through what we see. We don't have to look for darkness. It will find us. Movies, advertisements, the internet, we get flooded with temptations. And how do we gain control over all of these temptations of our eyes? Pornography, greed, appearance. You know, we would be embarrassed, I think every one of us would be embarrassed, if what we look at was broadcast on the screen. And yet it is, because the companies 
are feeding us exactly what we look at. What we look at matters. What we give our attention to matters because it affects our soul. We need to invest in seeking God so that we will see him. Nicodemus went to Jesus seeking God, but he was unable to see him. Coming under the dark of of night, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and this is what Jesus responds to him. Verse chapter 3, verse 20, John 3 20. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and he will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Can you imagine being the leader of Israel and hearing that rebuke? But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may not be so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I love testimonies of people who have started to see God in their lives. Lots of different ways. And before Easter, we, as a church, we recorded five different videos from members of our congregation who had seen God in the midst of darkness, dark times, difficulties, And we played some of those during our Lenten services and Good Friday, and some of them were just online as an opportunity to communicate to people that way. But the first one was Lisa Gentry as she battles cancer. Uh, Aaron Bogat fleeing Russia. Joy Fredmore in her recovery through alcoholism. Tasha Foss in her identity and mine through depression. Each of those was a testimony of seeing God in the midst of darkness. I don't know if any of you at second service woke up early enough to see the sunrise this morning. It was glorious. It was beautiful. And for, for second service, you can look at the sunset. I'm sure it'll be great also. <laughs> but either way, when you look at a beautiful sunrise or sunset... Can you not see God in his magnificence, his glory shining? Or when you look at the spring and, and the, all of things coming back to life and green sprouting up from the black ground, does not that display the glory of God, the work of God? But what about if you look at another person? Are you able to see God in that? Do you see mistakes and failures? Or even more personally, how about if you look in the mirror? Are you able to see God at work in your own lives? We need to be able to see God all the time, everywhere that we are looking. Rather than allowing the world to overwhelm us with what it wants us to see. Verse 24, last point. No one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The point is, invest in serving God. Who do you work for? Or what do you do? How do you see yourself? Maybe you're working, maybe you're... Do you see yourself as an employee, a student, a retiree, uh, a mom, a dad? Do you see yourself as one of those? Do you see a role as important? I was working in a difficult uh, work environment, and a friend of mine gave me this hat. Jesus is my boss. And so I, I didn't dare wear that cap. I didn't think that would be very respectful. But I put it in the corner of my office so that it would be a reminder to me that whatever I was doing, I was doing it as unto the Lord. I was serving Him. Not any of the secular pursuits that I was being asked to do. You might work in a secular work environment. Maybe you're a student in a school that has difficult 
people that you're going to school with. Non-Christians, to say the least. Or maybe you have friends that are challenging or neighbors that don't know God, don't even like Him. Well, have you ever thought about opportunity to praise the Lord? These are opportunities for you to be an undercover missionary. You have an opportunity to build relationships, to pray for people, and to share the hope that you have in Jesus. Regardless, sometimes they're even paying you to be a missionary without their knowledge. It doesn't matter what your vocation is. What matters is why you do it and who you do it for. We know about Paul, our biblical example, or Moses or Abraham or these pillars of the Bible. What about Tabitha, the quilter? Do we, do we recognize that name? Tabitha, who it says, who was full of good works and acts of charity. Or Cornelius the soldier, who was a devout man who feared God and gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God. Or Epiphras. I mean, these names don't come up in sermons very often. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. There are behind-the-scenes people all throughout the Bible. God knows every one of them by name. And that we have behind-the-scenes workers within our congregation that help keep things working and moving together. I have some friends in uh, Uganda who have been wise investors. These uh, six leaders over in Uganda have invested wisely. We call them the red shirts, much better than the red Mustang that I had. They took two years of their life to memorize the scriptures, the stories of the Bible, 84 of them, 2,200 verses. Then they took that same information and taught classes for two years. Then they coached their students that graduated from their class and allowed them, helped them become teachers of their own. Then they paid their own travel expenses to go and bring classes, bring the training of God to other places, farther places. Now they have been multiplying classes, teaching and and discipling others for 15 years. Now they're international missionaries. And they've invested their lives, every one of them, simple, simple backgrounds, very simple people. And they've invested their lives in hundreds of others. The point is, our life is short. We need to be wise about how we invest it. Our money, our time, our priorities. We do a lot of things for ourselves, and we will wish that we had invested in things that last. Invested in seeking God, seeing God, and serving Him. But today... As we come to the communion table, we are acknowledging that Jesus is our boss and that he indeed himself invested in you. That he left heaven to seek you. He gave his spirit so that you could see him. And he went to the cross to pay the debt, to serve you, to serve the sentence that you deserved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we we do get caught up in so many things from our world, things that are not lasting. We seek ourselves Rather than seeking you, we, we see what the world wants to give us rather than seeing you. Lord Jesus, change us as we come to receive what you have done on our behalf. Thank you, Jesus, for serving us. Thank you for investing in us. Thank you for seeking us out and for seeing the potential in us 
even when we can't see it ourselves, giving us your spirit, giving us your body and blood, making new lives possible. Lord, we give you our lives in response to what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.